it's now got to rely on giant Earth-based telescopes shooting radar signals to the moon. You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cosmic Cast, brought to you by the Earth and Solar System team at the University of Manchester. Your hosts today, it's me, Marissa Lowe, joined by John Pernay Fisher. Hello. Ricky Bahir. Hello. And Tom Harvey. Hello. And our guest this week is Gavin Tolometti from Western University. Hello, Gavin. Hello, thanks for having me on. Thanks very much for coming on. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I woke up early this morning to get my flu shot, so already Oops. pretty <laughs> energetic and up and about. <laughs> yeah, you seem very perky considering you've just had a, a jab. That's good. Um, amazing. So you're in your final year of your PhD. Um, and yeah, you do a huge, very impressive mix of stuff. Um, but could you give us a brief overview about your PhD topic? Yeah, certainly. Um, so I think the easiest way to explain it, I'm going to split it into two parts. Uh, because the overall title of my thesis, I actually haven't decided if I'm going to call it this yet, is the um, physical properties of volcanic and impact melt flows. So starting with the volcanic, which is only just lava flows, it's not any other volcanic uh, deposit. So what I do is I use a variety of remote sensing techniques, in particular radar, to study the roughness of lava flows on Earth that share similar like shapes and morphology to lava flows that we can see, or at least we could visually see through available remote sensing data on the moon. And why I use radar is like, since it measures roughness, it can tell us a little bit about how that lava flow was in place. And additionally, how it's probably been modified since it stopped moving. And what we're able to, and what's good about it is that one, we don't have to rely on daytime. The light up radar can be used at any time of the day. It's able to penetrate through cloud cover. It can even see through the subsurface if there's not a lot of material already blocking it. So it allows us to not only see how, just how rough all these different lava flows are, but we could also makes it easier to map and locate them, which is actually quite useful for planetary missions, trying to decide where to land. And so what I do is I take this radar data on Earth. I particularly study locations in Idaho and in Iceland. And I use it to try and compare it to radar data that's available on lunar missions and Martian missions to see how, if we can learn anything new about lava flows that we can see through their radar data. Now, the second part with the impact melts is, I think it's actually similar to an episode that I listened to you guys interview Dr. Lee White. Where he was talking about uh, electron backscatter diffraction on a daily light grain. It's essentially the same thing, actually, where we're looking at impact melts from the Mastastin Lake impact structure in Labrador, Canada, to try and find more zircon grains that show that rock formation temperatures during impact cratering events can exceed the 2,370 degrees Celsius uh, superheated temperatures. And this is actually following up the work from, it's a paper at Tim's et al. 2017, where they're the first ones to discover this type of uh, zirconia structure. I think it's a cubic zirconia, for anyone, for anyone who's interested. And so what we wanted to do is one, see if we could find more grains, because I think they only had two. So it's like two data points. It's like not really enough to say this is definitive. So my work was to go find more and to also find out if we could find more of those grains in other locations of the crater since they only looked at one site. So I wanted to like nab samples from as many sites as possible. So, and that could probably give us a better idea of how lunar impact melts may have been in place since a lot of, what we use a lot of models to simulate how melt is in place, but they assume temperatures are around 1700 degrees, which is high. It's much higher than a lava flow, but compared to what we're actually finding for impact melt, it's significantly cooler and they're probably getting incorrect results because of it. But if we can get more quantitative results saying this is actually a temperature you should be using in your models, we could probably get a better idea of why we're seeing very weird and unusual impact melt flows on the moon. So that's very much the big breakdown. That's a bit, it's a lot if you, well, it's very, it. it's very diverse as well. I guess you're really going from the macro to the micro, aren't you? How, how have you found sort of um, jugglings or more geochemically, geochemically type things to more remote sensing type things? 
Well, at first, with my background I got from my undergrad, the micro scale wasn't much of a problem. Uh, it was using petrography, uh, geochemistry, using X-ray fluorescence, and I was introduced to electron backscatter diffraction only early last year. So it wasn't one I, technique I used immediately that we actually adopted like halfway through my PhD. So that did involve a lot of reading to understand the technique and understand how they actually run these calculations and use the method. Um, the remote sensing data, I had almost no background in using remote sensing data other than using Google Earth in my undergrad. And, uh, and I guess uh, GIS as well, but I never really counted it as remote sensing until now. So that I actually had to learn as I was using the data. So, mm -hmm. but I think that comes with, I, when I talk to a lot of other pe people, they take PhDs, they, half of their research they had to learn on the job. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, it was definitely new. A lot of physics I had to catch up with because I hadn't taken physics past the year, first year of my undergrad. So it was a huge gap. I try to understand. And even now I'm still trying to understand it because it's, it's, there's a lot of new uh, research that keeps coming out. So you, mm. you keep wanting to stay on the ball. Um, so where do you get most of your radar data from both for Earth and for other bodies? So for Earth, we have now three sources. Uh, two of them are airborne. We're collected from instruments that are attached on giant Boeing planes. Uh, both operated by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, one's no longer in use. It's called the SR radar, so just air synthetic aperture radar instrument. Uh, I can't remember the year it stopped, but it's been replaced by the other data set we're using, which is the Uninhabited Aerial Vehicle Synthetic Aperture Radar instrument, so just UAV SAR. And that one's still in operation. The data we got from there was like in 2015, so it's still pretty new. And we've also, this is very new, we started using the Sentinel-1 radar data from the European Space Agency, which well, luckily enough, it's freely available. You just have to use their program to be able to process the data so you can read it. So we've been using a lot of that. And the good thing about that, that the Sentinel data is it's got almost global coverage. Right. With the SR and UAV SAR, since it's a plane, it's only selected sites. So if you don't have that available, you pretty much don't have radar data at that wavelength and resolution, but Sentinel ones almost everywhere. Is that quite coarse resolution then, I guess? It really depends. Um, the Sentinel one data, I've got some that are like 10 meters per pixel up to 25 meters per pixel. Okay. The SR and UVSAR, the UVSAR data is about eight meters per pixel and the SR, I get a lot of papers that range. The one I used, I managed to get to about eight to 10 meters per pixel, but some papers quote 15. So I think that's just how, either how they process it or whether they've downgraded it. So it's not, it's the, the for radar data, the resolution is actually pretty, pretty mm. good. Uh, and just for, for the audience, uh, they won't understand, obviously, well, some of them might not understand what that actually looks like. What's the visualization mm. of radar data? What is... Ooh, try to imagine a poorly taken picture that you can see all the pixels. Mm -hmm. And each of those pixels has been assigned a color. Let's make it easy to go from like blue to red. So if any time a radar analyzes a surface that's very smooth, let's say a field of grass, there's, there's just nothing on it, it's just a field of grass, it's gonna appear very blue. Is that just because everything is being reflected back to your sensor? Essentially, essentially yes. And since, and even blades of grass, since the scale of that's in like a millimeter, mm -hmm. so any radar is just going to assume it's a flat surface and just mm -hmm. reflect right back to the receiver. But let's say you have like a, let's say the easiest one I like to use to describe some lava is if you go to a construction site and you see piles of debris and rubble everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now let's say if you had a field, a field full of just debris mm -hmm. and a radar, the, air, the plane flies over there, radar signals hit that, that surface, it's going to scatter in so many directions, it's going to appear quite rough. So you're probably going to get a yellow orange -y color from that. Mm -hmm. And you can, and anytime you get red and white, it's usually how they describe it as either natural corners or cracks. So I think the best example of these lava flows that we call block lava flows, which are essentially meter sized scale, almost like a close to like cube sized blocks that are just piled up on top of each other. And if a radar signal hits those, it reflects twice before it returns to the receiver so that enhances the signal. So it okay. appears extremely rough. 
Mm. So it's a lot of things you have to consider though. If you're looking at something extremely rough, is it actually the surface or is there something else that's causing mm. the signal to be more enhanced than it actually is? Mm -hmm. yeah. And is that affected by the resolution of the data you receive then? Because obviously you're going to have, if you're using terrestrial data sets, I'm, I'm just assuming, are they higher resolution than you're going to get for the moon? Actually, the ones that we're using, they're essentially the same resolution. Oh, that's great. That's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. 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 You can get lower, higher resolution ones on Earth, but we don't have access to that data. Mm. Those, mm. The data. I think they're trying to improve the resolution. I'm pretty sure that's what the, oh, I don't want to quote the name of the mission is supposed to launch in the future because I might get the acronym wrong. So <laughs> it gives them an N and ends in SAR. I'm trying to remember what the middle letter is. <laughs> but if you type that on Google, it should appear. Because mm -hmm. um, the, the data we use for the moon is from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter miniature radio frequency instrument. Mm -hmm. So it collects uh, synthetic aperture radar data similar to Earth. The only big difference we ha they have right now, because the transmitter uh, malfunctioned quite early in the mission, it's now got to rely on giant Earth-based telescopes shooting radar signals to the moon and then bouncing off and then the instrument then catches those mm. signals. So it's what we call bi-static. So it's not coming from the same, the source is not the same. It's not coming from the instrument. So, and- That's remarkable yeah, that's you could do that though. That's amazing to think that you're shooting some radar signal to the moon and it's being detected by presumably what's quite a small instrument orbiting it. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite impressive if you think about it, especially if you, when they shoot it from the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto mm. Rico, that's a giant mm. dish just, and they have to wait for the right moment because it can only tilt uh, at a very small angle window. So mm. it's very impressive when you think about it. Yeah. So when you're looking at this radar data, do you then have the comparable sort of image data of the lunar surface there to help interpret those features? Yes, we do have to get the um, visible data. So, because as one thing I actually do try to stress more in my PhD thesis is the, you can't rely on just one remote sensing data set because it can only give you one piece of information. You usually want to gather as many as you can, but so I like to get radar data, spectral data, and not spectral data, visible data, and now topography data because the topography and roughness are not the same type of property. And, but we do like to get the narrow angle camera images, which I guess anyone in the audience isn't familiar with it. It's usually you could get visible resolution of the moon up to about half a meter if, you are, if you're lucky enough to find, to get it. But I think it's like half a meter to two meters, mm. depending on the image. Mm -hmm. Um, so we were talking about the different things you'd see in the radar images, and you said that you'd be able to distinguish between, say, different lava flows with different textures. What, are you, what information are you hoping to get from that? You know, what kind of conclusions can you draw from that about the different flows that you've been looking at? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I say, I guess I'll use my example from Craze of the Moon. It's a very, comp it's a polygenetic, so that just means that the lavas have all come from different sources at different times. It's a very complex, if you type Google pictures of it, it looks very chaotic and confusing. Uh, essentially it's got, I didn't even get to study all of them, but I studied about five different lava flow types at my one field site near the visitor center there. And that's just like a tiny little snippet of the entire lava field. And we noticed that you get these smooth, there's one that we call smooth or hoi hoi. It's, somewhat similar to what we see in Hawaii, where you see those very low glassy like flows moving around. Mm -hmm. So usually what we could say from those flows, if we find them is that, okay, they had to have erupted very slowly because their crust hasn't been disrupted. They've been able to maintain its form and the temperature had to have been high when it first came out because it didn't cool. It's able to cool quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the rougher flows, if it was to say, if we found like an RR uh -uh lava flow, again, similar to Hawaii, we can tell, can say that the it would have been in place quite quickly because its surface has been disrupted constantly. So, and, but then we have a problem. That's only two like standard lava flows that we know. We know this very smooth pohoys or very, or rough R's, but we have another class that are called transitional lava flows. 
and they form from the mechanical fracturing of the crust, which has nothing to do with usually the rhyology or just the general makeup of the lava. Mm. So what happens with these is sometimes if they, let's say the fusion rate or just how quickly lava gets erupted onto the surface increases, the crust can then suddenly become disrupted and break. And they can form types called slabby, which is from the name, just giant slabs of crust that have been tilted. Or it could get rubbly, which is when those slabs then get broken apart even more. So it just looks like a construction site on a lava flow. And then you get the ones I mentioned earlier, block. Those are like very unusual ones. They form when the lava flows like 55 weight percent of silica and above. Mm -hmm. So they're usually rare occasions. They usually need a very evolved or magmatic source to erupt those. And when we see those on radar data, we realize that the signals are actually very similar and you can't tell, distinguish them from one another, which bodes a problem because if you, if you were to find something similar to let's say on the moon and you're gonna say like this, okay, all these signals are the same. I'm gonna say it's this one type of lava flow. It's an a lava flow that seems to have erupted from the source, end of story, this is what happened, which wouldn't be right. If you find out actually none of them are lava flows, you've actually got a combination of a slabby, which has now become a rubbly, the further way good from event. So your interpretation of that volcanic eruption is actually false. It's not due to high effusion. It could not, might not be due to high effusion rates and disru constant disruption. It could have been originally a smooth flow, which was then maybe later disrupted or just later on in the eruption broken up. So it then, once you get that eruption wrong, you start to think, well, what other volcanic eruptions have we interpreted incorrectly on the planetary surfaces? Then do we really understand how these lava flows are actually being emplaced? on the mm -hmm. surface. So I'm not saying everyone, I'm, but I'm not saying like every interpretation has been done on the moon is wrong. I'm just saying you have to sometimes take off a grain of salt, especially if you use mm -hmm. radar data because we're still trying to figure out how we can distinguish these lava flows from one another, mm -hmm. which is actually one part of my PhD, which is a challenging, challenging task. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, I guess as well, I mean, how much do you worry about things like the sort of the different gravity conditions and I guess the slight, chemical differences that lunar magmas have relative to terrestrial magmas? We haven't really considered gravity, uh, but we have considered composition. Uh, one bit, when it comes to radar analysis on the moon, the one thing that lunar scientists say you have to be aware of is the titanium hmm. concentration because the presence of ilmenite actually attenuates radar signals, which lowers them. So you could might actually have a rougher lava flow, but if it's rich in titanium or ilmenite, it's going to appear smoother because it's absorbing the signals. Yeah. So it's useful for mapping lava flows because you know like, oh, here's, and especially if you put titanium concentration data on top of it, you can kind of mm. see the differences. Mm. On Earth, the lava flows we looked at were, it barely had any ilmenite, if not, barely, none of them had any in them that we could see. And the titanium concentrations were low. So we knew we didn't really have to worry too much about composition yeah. and gravity. I guess this comes back to this point you mentioned earlier about you know using multiple different data sets to really mm -hmm. understand an area. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, have you incorporated any field work into your PhD then? Oh yeah, the field work's definitely. Uh, I think it's like the data. Fifty percent of it's from field work. Um, it's another part of it is to ground truth all this remote sensing data since mm -hmm. in planetary science unless you're looking exactly where Atlanta or a rover is, you're never gonna be able to properly ground truth anything. That's mm -hmm. what we love about Earth when it comes to terrestrial analogs is that we can test, we look at the data before we go out there and we think, okay, this is saying this, but let's actually go out there and find out what, it's, what it really is. And that's where we came to the whole controversy that these lava flows are all different, but they appear exactly the same under the data, why? Mm -hmm. And if we can't figure out why, should we, we be being a bit more scrutinous when it comes to interpreting data. So I spent two summers at Creators of the New National Monument and Preserve in Idaho. I actually went to the first one, I went there two months after I graduated at, from my undergrad. So it was by I finished, I had to quickly fill out paperwork and then I was off mm -hmm. essentially. I've and, got to ask, actually, was it intentional that you chose Craters of the Moon as a, an analog <laughs> for, for looking at lunar lava flows? <laughs> uh, no, that I, and if it was intentional, it was a happy accident. But um, <laughs> uh, I, it was pretty much my, my soon, at the time, my soon-to-be supervisor said, like, this is the site we're going to be going to. I'm like, okay. I'd never heard of it before, so I had to start 
Google searching because I genuinely thought it was like a bunch of like holes in the ground scattered around. Mm -hmm. And then I was a little bit shocked when it was just a giant lava field. Yeah. Uh, and then you mentioned also using data for Iceland. Have you had the chance to go there as well? Mm. Yes, um, I got to go in 2019, so like summer 2019 before everything stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were quite fortunate to do that. And it, that was actually still, I think, one of my most favorite field expeditions because one, first time I actually ever been to Iceland. So mm -hmm. it was a touristy trip for me as well. Um, I also, it was a little bit more, ner but also the most nervous field work I ever had to do because at the time my supervisor, she was on maternity leave and she tasked me to be in charge of logistics mm -hmm. of and health and safety and essentially everything except for permits because we had a collaborator who knows the Icelandic government so he took mm -hmm. care of the, all of that. Um, so it was the first time I had to sort out making sure all the health and safety forms are filled. We had all the reservations we needed. We had the vehicle, which I have to say, trying to rent vehicles and get the one you need to go cross country in Iceland that's nervous enough as it is because it made me a bit anxious getting it from enterprise. Yeah. <laughs> because, um, because when you're in Iceland, they, they, we, had, we were told that if you, to get to the field site, you have to cross at least two rivers to get there. There's oh, no God. bridge or anything. So they say your vehicle has to be able to either filter out water so it doesn't get into the engine or it's tall enough that you don't have to worry about it getting stuck or swept away. Yeah, I mean, I so guess- So I was having to- <laughs> Yeah, because both for the audience, I guess, like cross country in Iceland, it's proper like gravel roads. And uh, if you break mm. down and you don't have enough petrol with you, that's it, you're stranded. <laughs> <laughs> oh, exactly. It's like we're thinking, I had to keep thinking like, all, right, all of this, all the things that just could go wrong. So I had to keep thinking like, if this went wrong, how do we fix it? And if that fixing also went wrong, how do we fix that? Until we get to the point, it's like, well, we're going to have to find a way <laughs> out of this. Yeah, it's pretty hairy stuff. I remember once, um, so I did a bit of field work in, uh, in Iceland uh, during my PhD, and uh, we actually managed to get a flat tire uh, on our hire car. And we decided it'd be a good idea to actually try and change the, uh, the wheel on one of those gravel roads. And I just remember the panic as, as we jacked the car up, <laughs> the whole jack just started sinking into the gravel road. <laughs> it was like, okay, right, we've really got to change this tire right now, haven't we? <laughs> It's like life gave you a timer. It's like, okay, you have 30 seconds before it's gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, did it all go quite smoothly then? The it did. Ahead? It did, yes. We didn't have any major problems. Every, we got, we crossed the rivers safely, <laughs> uh, which was very, that was probably the most nervous part. And yeah, we spent about 10 days out in the, it's the, called the Askia region. Mm -hmm. I hope I haven't butchered the name. Uh, and it's like very cool area. It's very remote. It's just a station. It's like a campsite and then a great ranger station. And we had to, we got to go to the, it's called the Holarun Lava Flow Field. Mm. Got, so it was very uh, beautiful lava field. It was only erupted in tw late 2014. So it's still very pristine because the only erosion they have to worry about there is wind and a gla glacial meltwater rush. And it was, and we even got to go to the vent, which is still, I wouldn't say active, but it was still warm because, yeah, it was. We could still see fumaroles, which if it, it's just like where areas where water's gone into the, around the vent, and it's like reducing, producing all this gas and steam. And yeah, it was a very, very fun and stressful field work. <laughs> That's awesome. So uh, just before we started recording, then, so you, you mentioned briefly then that uh, Icelandic samples are more similar to Martian stuff. Uh, yes, the Hollering one has got more similarities to Martian lava flows because it from a, like, formed a chemical... through a... Oops, sorry. Sorry, go on. Oh, so... oh no, no worries. Uh, not really from a chemical point of view. It's more of morphologic, it's just how it, look, how it looks. Hmm. And also just its volcanic setting because it formed through like tectonic flood basalt volcanism. Hmm. So which is, which is like not ta labeled as probably the number one style of volcanism or one of the most common styles of volcanism on Mars, besides the flows that came from Olympus and Arius Mons and the rest of the volcanoes. So it's why it had more of a connection to Mars and I think the moon. So it's right now we haven't been able to look at many lava flow, Martian lava flow examples. That's probably gonna be a very small portion of the PhD. We're more concerned about trying to 
once again, distinguish different lava flow types because it's got more than five mm -hmm. from such, in such a much smaller area. And we're having to use similar techniques, but we've also been using more ground-based remote mm -hmm. sensing to study all of them. Yeah. Okay. If you mention then that there are some problems then in, in using radar for identifying different lava types when you actually go and visit them, do you feel quite hopeful that radar is, could actually be useful for making these distinctions? It, it can be useful. It's, it's a question of what else are you using hmm. with it. I mean, it, depending on the resolution of the visible data that, that you've got, that, can easily, that could probably help you distinguish which is which because mm -hmm. some of them, especially a lot of flows like slabby flows, you can tell it's a slabby flow if your resolution is good enough in a visible mm -hmm. imagery. So you can immediately say like, okay, that's a slabby flow. We can put that aside. The only problem is you have some like an ah and a roughly flow. They right now they could look very similar under mm -hmm. visible imagery. So it's those ones are a little bit harder to, to tell, but it's why there's a lot of like projects that are testing drone technology. Mm -hmm. So hopefully eventually we could use drones on other planets to study these lava flows. And then if you could look at the drone data, go like, okay, it's clearly this type of flow. That's what the remote sensing data was trying to tell us. So it's a it's a problem, but not much, so much a problem that I would say don't ever use radar data. It's useless. It's just more of a problem that you can't just only use it. Just know its limits, I guess. Them. Yes. Cool. So just to go back to uh, Iceland, you, you um, so when you went out into the field, did you just hack up a few pieces of rock and take them back with you? And, uh, and what did you do with those samples that you actually collected there? So we did hack up some rocks. Uh, I only took like 15 in total. They were, they were mainly just so I could get and I remind myself what these, the textures on the surface looked like if I needed to. We were going to do some petrographic work just to take a look at uh, vesicle distributions and see what the mineralogy was like, but that wasn't really a huge interest to us. Mm. Problem is that's when I had all the samples ready to go, that's when lockdown started. So it, it was kind of put on a not even a get to it when you get to it, it's more of a like only get to it if you've literally done everything else before your defense. <laughs> so if you don't have it in your thesis, it's it's fine, but <laughs> kind of thing. So, but they're there for someone else to use. Mm, that's good. Um, have there been any parts of your project where you've incorporated say meteorite samples into the project? Uh, no, actually, no, we've, meteorites haven't really come into this project, I think, when I mentioned the impact melt study, it would be cool to maybe look at a meteorite sample and try and find similar minerals mm -hmm. in it. But I feel like that might be more of a continued study and maybe in a postdoc position. Mm. Um, I mean, yeah, Gavin, it does sound like you've done a lot. Of work. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave that to someone else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've got yeah, a few I'll... years to do it. That would be fine it, as well. It, exactly, yeah. I think I was at the start, I'd say like, you know what, yeah, let's get a meteorite thrown in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> might as well, yeah, just throw that in. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> um, but yeah, that might lead quite nicely into saying um, you also have done a very, very cool internship during your PhD, um, the Lunar and Planetary Institute Exploration Science Internship, I believe. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, would you mind telling us a bit about that? Um, oh, de definitely. Uh, it was probably one of the best summers I have had. It was uh, one of the opportunity to go work with a group of amazing students at the Lunar Planetary Institute. Uh, I think you guys know one of them, uh, Sam Bell. So like, she was really great to work with, gone on really well, especially when she brought, she managed to get Robinson's squash drinks shipped over to Houston. <laughs> that was, I think it was a really good day because I saw it and went, oh, I haven't had Robinson's in so long. <laughs> Aww. Uh, so. And getting to watch Chicken Run for like the first time in over 10 years, that brought back nostalgia. <laughs> well, we had to introduce it to the Americans because then they didn't really understand the accents. They were like, what, what is this accent? But it's like, <laughs> even half of the UK doesn't really know. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we, get, we got to learn, we got to focus on, stud one, we got to map a location in the Schrodinger Basin on the far side of the moon. So we got to get, learn how to use different remote sensing data sets and apply them to be able to map out and identify what we thought were exposed, what we think are exposed outcrops on the lunar surface. 
which not many papers really reference outcrops. They'll say boulders, but they never really say outcrops. So we wanted to try and map out outcrops because they should be a bigger target for exploration than a boulder if you can get to them. Uh, so that for we got to we mapped out one section. We got to design a rover traverse to try and address high priority science goals that NASA has implemented, even the European Space Agency has implemented. And the other and it was like the other half of the team were trying to understand the trafficability of lunar regolith at different locations. So they looked at lunar regolith from Mare, for the lava flows of the moon regions, pyroclastics, uh, highland material, and also permanently shadowed regions, the locations of the moon that we don't get any sunlight, because it'd be interesting to know, like, if a rover went in there, could it actually traverse on this material, or is it going to have any difficulty? So it was like two completely different projects, but it was really, really uh, memorable. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, how, how was it working from with, with so many different people from all over the place? No, it was very, it's very eye-opening because I think it sometimes reminds you that everyone has different, different uh, mindsets, different schedules, but it's good to learn about all these different, different styles because then you learn how to, one, you can work, one, work with them, two, adapt if you needed to adapt your work schedule to fit with the team. So I think it was actually very beneficial in that way. That's good. Yeah, um, I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but I applied to do the internship this summer, um, got a place, accepted the place, but then it's 2020, nothing's gone to plan. Yeah. <laughs> um, so hopefully we'll be reapplying for next summer. So touch wood that it all goes okay for yeah, then. Touch wood. Yeah, it sounds like such a fun internship. I think the only thing that wasn't fun was the two, the hundred degree weather, hundred <laughs> percent humidity. That was Those are not gross. ideal working conditions. I mean, that sounds pretty oh. good to me. <laughs> oh, oh no, that's only outside. But then once you get inside, it's five degrees because they crank the AC yeah. up. <laughs> so you're either sweating outside or you're shivering inside. There's no in between. Mm. So, yeah. Um, but it sounds like you got to go to some really cool places around Houston. Um, I've seen lots of cool pictures of you all in uh, clean suits and things like that. <laughs> yeah, we got to go into, the, that was our first, yeah, it was our first day we got to go to the Apollo sample creation vault, which like, we were all buzzing about. So like, oh my God, we're actually going to go in there. We get to see all the samples. We got to see the Genesis rock. Uh, we got to see the, I think what they call it, the seatbelt. They nicknamed the seatbelt rock. We got the interesting story. Oh, I can't, it's really embarrassing. I can't remember the name of the astronaut, but pretty much said he had a seatbelt problem on the lunar <laughs> lunar rover and because he just wanted to sample a rock but NASA wouldn't let him They're like oh seatbelt's broken so he said okay fix the seatbelt and just went to pick up the sample take notes get back in go like yeah seatbelt's fine yeah that was, and then uh, just keep going <laughs> it was Dave Scott on Apollo 15 we actually Dave might Scott. have okay. a video coming on this channel about that very soon so that's uh, a good plug right there <laughs> <laughs> Okay, swear that wasn't scripted. That's just what we saw. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we got to go to the Apollo creation site. We got to go see the Dragon capsule and some what the Orion capsule as well when it was still still being built. That was that was how it was really planned. It just happened to happen while we were there, and we got to go in. Although awkward enough, we could get everyone who was an in international could get in, but the Americans were first weren't able to because there we had different passes, but for some reason ours could allow us to go in as long as we had our escort, but the American one students couldn't. I'm still not entirely sure why. We just came to the door and they looked at our pass and said like, you six can go in, but unfortunately you four can't. So <laughs> they had to go on the skywalk that tourists take at the museum and then just watch us <laughs> walk around. <laughs> so it's like, hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's so strange. I thought it would have been the other way around. Yeah. That's what we thought, like, how is it that we've gone into, we're not Americans, but we got in, but the Americans aren't even allowed in. So it's very weird. Yeah. So, and it was also the same year as uh, we had the Apollo 13 Symphony concert, mm. which that was a very, very fun trip. It's been so long since I saw the movie and getting to see it with a symphony and an orchestra, that was actually quite cool. Amazing. Wow. Um, so yeah, it would probably be great to ask you how did you end up studying uh, planetary science in the first place um so i knew this question was going to come and i wish i had an answer that I, I was listening to some of your older podcasts and some of the 
other PhD students and scientists, they have like these amazing, these, oh, since I was five years old, I looked up at the moon and it's like, that's what I knew. Or they had all these very revelational stories. And I think for me, it was kind of by accident. It wasn't really planned. Like during my undergrad, I was very into like just hard rock geology. So it was all petrology, it was all geochemistry. Originally when I started, it was supposed to go into oil, but then I realized I actually hate the industry. Mm -hmm. So, and it's very depressing. I kept telling myself, the if the money is not worth it, I don't care how many figures you put there, it's not. I don't want to spend my life in a very, what well, I find a quite a little bit of a depressing atmosphere. And then kept on going. It wasn't until the fourth year of my undergrad where we had a new professor come in, uh, Dr. Sammy McKell. He introduced oh. planetary science to our advanced igneous and metamorphic course. So he taught his first lecture was on comparing Venus, the petrology of Venus and Earth, and showing that they're actually probably going to be quite similar because of their size and, and all the different processes. Mm. So I think it was then I started to realize, actually, this is actually a very cool field. And it, it, the more I think about it, the more I should have taken my dissertation should have been a planetary science theme because I still did uh, like a mining based dissertation which it was still cool but I didn't really probably enjoy it as much as I hoped I would but and then after that I started looking for a master degree master's degrees um during my first semester of my fourth year a friend of mine she did a year abroad at Western University and she told me about some of the professors and how they do planetary science and that I should reach out to them so I started applying I sent out emails thinking like well hopefully one of them gets a response back I did I got a response back from uh, Dr. Gordon Nazinski, which was actually even funnier because he was an alumni of St. Andrews. So I think he, I think he saw the, the St. Andrews email and thought like, oh, it's okay. So from my old little tomato. And uh, we, we kept on chatting. He then introduced me to my other supervisor, Dr. Catherine Nish. We, she said they got funding for this project. It's supposed to last for two years. So they said, if I wanted to go for a master's degree, I should definitely apply. Mm. And then few months later, got, I think it was like at 11 p.m., got the acceptance email. I can't remember, I think it was just up anyway. I think I just came back from my part-time job and I was just looking at my emails and I saw it. I was like, holy moly, this is gonna be great. And then <laughs> I did have to think, like, oh great, now I gotta move across the Atlantic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I hated moving then, now it doesn't bother me as much. I think once you do it once, it kind of sinks in, but. I, yeah, it's, but then as soon as I got to Western, that's when I really started to fall in love with planetary science. Until then, it was still like I love, I like it, but I wouldn't say I was like, lo I loved it. So mm -hmm. I still love geology, but did I like love planetary science? Not just yet. But I think after my first year, I started taking new courses. I got to do all this field work and get involved with all these projects. I think that's when I started to realize there's a lot. Like we just, I know we, there's a lot we don't know about our own planet, but we know even less about other planets and moons. And I think if we want to be able to understand our planet, we should be trying to understand them because the moon in particular, because it's got all the information that we need. So I think that's at that moment, that's when I fell in love with planetary science. And I have not looked back since. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I mean, that's sort of the opposite story we get to other people from other people. Yeah, we do normally get the, oh, I watched this movie when I was younger and knew I wanted to be an astronaut. And now my enthusiasm is dropping. <laughs> You've gone the other way, which is really nice. <laughs> I still have those days that I think, but that's mainly just through frustration from writing and your coding scripts not working. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, your enthusiasm has definitely come across. As I see, you've done a lot of science outreach. Um, I believe you also are part of a um, university podcast as well. Uh, is it Gra Gradcast? Yes, Gradcast Radio. That's uh, it's the Society of Graduate Students uh, committee here so it's just all different PhD and master students from a variety of departments we all just come onto the show and we interview other graduate students at Western University talk to them about their research the newest question is like so how's COVID treating you <laughs> so that's it used to be like oh what's grad life what was before this all happened we would ask so what's like life outside of research for you like what do you like to do now it's like how has COVID impacted your life? <laughs> <laughs> what new hobbies have you picked up? <laughs> yeah, that's, is that a, like just a general question or a general question? No, that would be, that would be what I would be asking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although I have seen that you've been doing some really good baking, Gavin, over lockdown. That's been nice to see on the, yeah. on the timeline. 
yeah, I've been trying to get a bit, I, I at least love doing it during my undergrad, but I rarely had the time, funny enough, how I have more time now um, to do it. And it's been, it, I've gone through so many where everything goes, is complete disaster. I still can't <laughs> get some baking to work. I either don't bake, it's in for longer and still doesn't bake, or especially if I bake cookies, I don't know what it is. They either don't, they either become giant blocks just like puddles or they burn quickly so i think it's kind of a curse that i have no matter what i do it just doesn't work i prefer cooking more because at least that i can experiment but with baking if you're not precise everything can just go wrong it's true you're baking uh, what you just said about baking just sounded so analogous to a phd in general to be fair <laughs> <laughs> you could yep yeah, you can follow all the steps but you know what sometimes in the end you're just going to get a melted cookie is that, um, yeah, is exactly that, yeah. I mean, at least you can eat the cookies at the end of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's uh, a question of like, oh, this is not the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if people want to check out that podcast, is that on Spotify and iTunes? It is on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. Um, we'll, we'll we do have a, a website. In the description. Oh, we'll link to that as well. Yeah, yeah it's uh, gradcast.ca. And I think I actually posted three new episodes recently. So it's a little episode series. So you should check it out. I just called it "How Does Co- How Has COVID nineteen Impacted Western Research?" Mm-hmm. Cool, so that sounds pretty interesting. Pretty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've definitely found myself listening to podcasts more over lockdown. I suppose mm. if we're just in all the time, it's it's like you guys are all with with me, right? Like we're in just the tea room or something, chatting to each other. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, guys, I miss you. <laughs> well on that note gavin I-, I guess you probably knew this question was coming at some point and it seems like that point is now i don't know why i'm dragging this out but, but, uh, sounds really sinister it does. yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we've got to hit a time for our ad revenue now Yes, that's why. Yeah, yeah, we need to hit that hour mark. And so, if you weren't in academia and mm. you weren't um, analyzing these amazing lava flows on Mars, Moon, and on Earth, what do you think you'd be doing with your life? Oh, I actually had to. I actually had to think about this before coming on. Um, I remember at one point in school, I did want to become a professional chef. Mm. That was on my agenda, mm. but I think I. I stopped because I know some people say like, if you love your hobby, don't make it a, a career mm-hmm. because then you'll end up hating it. And I part my part-time during my undergrad, I worked in the kitchen, didn't get to do any cooking though. It was just washing, but I've seen the behind the scenes of what can happen when it just becomes very chaotic. I'm like, mm-hmm. I think I would, I wouldn't be able to, <laughs> to yeah. work in that situation. I'd either get too flustered or I'd be, end up becoming too sarcastic that I don't mean to be. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, being a uh, chef does look like a very stressful it career. It does. It looks yeah. quite intense. Well, I guess I've only really seen House Kitchen, but it certainly looks uh, <laughs> it looks quite stressful, yeah. Well, I'm not going to lie. Over lockdown, I started watching almost every season of Master Chef. So that one was... I actually quite enjoy it, even with the... the even with Greg Wallace. <laughs> yeah, even then. Yeah. Well, this was the American version. Because it's oh, the okay. one I can eat. I can easily eat, like, get streaming but i still need to watch there's a british canadian one and an australian one oh yeah i've seen a few of the australian ones actually they're, they're quite good yeah yeah say, if Greg Wallace is watching, i'm sorry I, I, I do enjoy you on <laughs> <laughs> uh but and then at one point i actually maybe thought about being an raf pilot oh wow okay uh, wow so <laughs> it was more of like follow somewhat follow my dad's footsteps but he was an engineer he was never a pilot hmm. so and I was in the air training corps cadets like when I was in school. So I got to do, I got to dabble into flying, but I could never land a glider properly. So I could, I don't know if I trust myself. an integral part of flying. Training. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, they called it balloon landing. I'd hit the runway, but then I'd bounce back up again. Oh. And it's, that's a big no. <laughs> was that not right, scary? I, it first time it was not bad when they were demonstrating what could go wrong and then they were in control but it isn't scary when you're just cruising and then they go like all right you have control i'm like okay <laughs> <laughs> you're like no no i don't, no, I don't. <laughs> but you can't show that you're scared because then they will get nervous so you just get yeah. in your mind you're just going like well 
this might be it. <laughs> Hope everyone has a good, <laughs> good day. Oh, that sounds so terrifying. it was, um, I think the, I was just really juggling between those two. But then once I got into undergrad, that just all changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And great. Well, that's a great answer. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Indeed. Well, Gavin, thanks so much uh, for joining us. It's been a great conversation and I wish you the best of luck with the rest of your PhD. Um, so again, for the audience, we'll, we'll pop some various links and stuff in the episode description if you want to read more about the research and, and if you want to check out the podcast. Uh, but in the meantime, if you want more Earth and Solar System content, do check out our social media. All the links will be on the screen uh, below and in the episode description. We're on the Twitters, the Instagrams and all the rest of it. Uh, but until next time, we all hope that you have a lovely week uh, and we'll see you next time on the Cosmic Cast. Goodbye. Bye.